the Lord, that we are women who are free to praise in your name, Lord God. So look, everybody up on their feet, we're giving God a hand clap of praise, amen, as we welcome Minister B.J. Pons. Amen, amen. Um, this morning, I haven't sung this song in a long time, but I wanted to open up with it. And uh, I want everybody to stand while I sing it. You know, the enemy will come against us and, uh, and try to make us feel like we can't have what God said we can have. And sometimes we just have to get our believer in us really standing up strong. Because sometimes you just have to stand and declare something even when you don't feel it, right? When you don't really believe it, sometimes we have to stand up and declare it anyway. And so this song says, I have to believe, and I'm going to read some of these words. I have to believe that he sees my darkness. I have to believe that he knows my pain. I have to lift up my hands in worship and worship his name. Why do I have to worship? Because I am praising him on credit, knowing that as I praise him, as I pour out to him, he's going to in turn pour back into me. So as I sing this song, I want y'all to just start declaring within yourselves. Y'all know what's going on in your life and say, God, I'm, I'm going to stand here and declare it even though I don't feel it. Even though my faith isn't even at a mustard seed stage yet, I'm going to believe you for the impossible things that I'm facing in my life today. Amen? Amen. All righty. Let's see if we can get the music to play. Turn it up. And I don't think this monitor's on here. Oh, I have to believe that he sees my darkness. I have to believe that he knows my pain. I have to lift up my eyes in worship to worship his name. Oh, I have to declare that he is my refuge. I have to deny that I am alone. I have to lift up my eyes to the mountains. It's where my help comes from. Oh, because he's there. That he forever faithful, yes he is. He said he's forever true. Oh, he said he can move mountains. If he can move mountains, he can move my mountain. Oh, in your mountain too. Oh, I have to stand tall when the wind blows me over. I have to stand strong when I'm weak and afraid. I have to grab hold, a hold of the garment, the garment of praise. Oh, cause he said he forever faithful yes he is he said he's forever true oh he said he can move mountains if he can move mountains he can move your mountain too I have to sing praise when the hour is midnight, because he unlocks the chains 
that bind up my soul, my sin and my shame. For he has forgiven and he made me holy as he did. Oh, because he said he, oh, he's forever faithful. He said he's forever true. He said he can move mountains. If he can move my mountain, he can move your mountain too. Oh, he said he's forever faithful. Yes, he is. Oh, forever true. Can move mountains, yes he did. If he can move my mountain, he can move your mountain too. I have to believe. We have to believe. Oh, he's got everything in control. So we have to believe his word is true. Let us believe him today, amen. So today we're going to stand up and we're going to declare that God's word is true and that everything else is a lie, amen, amen. Well, praise God, y'all can have a seat. I'm going to open up with one more song, but before I go into it, <coughs> I want to thank my, my wonderful sis for um, inviting me to come to the conference and to be a part of it. Um, Karina, can you grab my drink by my chair for me? And I want to uh, thank the pastor of the house who is not here this morning. At least I didn't see him. If he's here, he's hiding. He's here. <laughs> he's listening somewhere. Hey, Pastor John, I love you. <laughs> and uh, I appreciate the fact that they trust me to be able to take this platform because you know, it takes a lot for, um, as some of these pastor's wives know, to just let anybody up take a microphone. <laughs> they do a whole lot of damage in just a short little bit of time. So I, I praise God that, um, you know, the Lord has blessed our family with a lot of ministers. And people look at our family and think we were all perfect. <laughs> it wasn't so. <laughs> it wasn't so. <coughs> there was all kind of issues and problems in our home. <coughs> but the difference was God, that we had God in our lives. And my mom, her poor knees are so calloused from her praying every single one of us through. <laughs> I'm serious, including herself, you know. And she interceded and she taught and she believed um, on our behalf. And so today... All eight of her children are ministers and minis married to ministers. Now, my husband says, I am not a minister. <laughs> Everybody calls him Rev. Everybody calls him Rev because he always has a word of wisdom or something for somebody. And uh, even though he wants to deny that call, he's, he's a minister. Um, and so, God, that's a blessing. That's a blessing. And it didn't come easy. I mean, one of my brothers was such an alcoholic that they told him that if he took another drink, he was going to die because of cirrhosis of the liver. And he's pastor in a huge church in, ba in Pittsburgh right now. Another one strung out on crack and all kinds of other drugs. And he's pastoring in Pittsburgh right now. So many of us just gone wrapped up in our own issues and our own problems. And God is using each and every one of us. So a lot of times you might look at ministers up here and think, oh, they got it all together. They don't even know what I'm going through. They, they've never been through nothing. <laughs> and then you find out, wait, what? 
and I want you to know that, you know, that we're not perfect people, that we have problems. And the Lord had me start a little thing on my Facebook page that um, <coughs> it's called uh, Real Life Unfiltered. <laughs> and whenever something uh, really real life happens, I'm posting about it. And so I had a problem with my hair about a month or two ago. I decided I was going to buy one of those little tiny wands, you know, and uh, do all these tiny little curls in my hair because I couldn't figure out how to get the rollers in my hair. So I decided I'd just use a curling iron and just burnt my hair to a crisp. Yes, it was bad. And then I was so, you know, trying to cover up the gray that I put my color over top of my relaxer. And then so I started having pieces falling out over here and over here. My hair was jacked up. Then I went to some girl to have her try to fix it. And, well, I just put it like this. She had never seen my type of hair before in her life. <laughs> and when I sat down in that chair, <laughs> her eyes was just like, oh, my gosh, I got to cut your hair. And so she starts cutting, and I'm like, wait, stop, 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 stop. No, don't do it anymore. She jacked my hair up so bad she had to go get her manager. And the manager comes back, and she tries to fix it. It was a mess. And so I got on Facebook. I had gone to another hairstylist, and she's trying to fix everything. And, and, and I wanted to be real. And so I took the picture without my makeup on, which shows I've got – uh, uh, what's, what's it called? Mal yeah, whatever somebody just said. With the brown spots, big ones. Here, 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 and here. And, you know, women, we want to hide behind filters all the time. And most of the time, I wish I could walk around in real life <laughs> with a filter. <laughs> it would be awesome. You know, smooth out the wrinkles, cover up all the dark spots make my hair nice and full and the perfect color and, you know, give to shave a, a few of the rolls down, you know, so I don't have to wear these big old floppy things to hide them, you know. <coughs> but real life is that we all have flaws. We all have problems. We all have issues. But we have God to see us through each and every one of them. And the wonderful thing about my wonderful Savior is that no matter how far I get away from him, how disobedient I am, how hard-headed I am, he loves me. And he's just standing there just like, okay, when you're done, having your little thing, come on back, come on back. So I'm trying to get into my message before I sing my song. I have a habit of doing that. But I'm going to sing this song called It Won't Rain Forever. It is on my new CD which I do not have any of. <laughs> I don't have them here. Um, we ran out at my last conference. And so um, it is on iTunes. It's on Amazon. Um, and you can stream it on Spotify uh, and all the other streaming things. But I do have other CDs back there. And I have some T-shirts. Um, and I want you to know this. And, and this is the first time I'm announcing this publicly. I have I have tried not to announce it because I've been terrified to announce it because <laughs> then it, it like puts that stamp of now you got to follow through with it. But as you know, we did, um, some of y'all know, I did my first ladies retreat this past year and we had a tremendous time. It's where I do my retreats is a beautiful Victorian house out in the country. And when I say beautiful, it is gorgeous. Um, three floors, actually it's four floors because you got the, the attic area where um, it's, it's just gorgeous. Big, beautiful lake out front, wraparound porch, just gorgeous. And uh, we had the price set at 375 which is actually a very reasonable price for that type of venue. And all your food was included, your t-shirt, your swag bags, everything. And... The Lord told me, I want you to do your retreats for free. <laughs> and it took my breath away. And I thought, <laughs> at first I said, that's not God. 
you know, because that's not wisdom, you know. <laughs> that's not wisdom. That cannot be God saying this. But I could not get away from it. And then he, he upped the ante. <laughs> and he said, and I want you to do it twice a year. He said, I want my women ministered to, and I don't want them to have to pay to get it. Because in our day, it's hard to come by that kind of funds. And God told me that if I will trust him, he has a blank check for me. And I just need to write the amount that I need, and he will provide it if I will trust him. And so everything that's on my table as you buy, just know that those funds are going toward the next retreat, which is in October 2023. And then we'll have another one in the following spring, 2024. And then from then on, it'll be twice a year. And he's throwing a whole lot of other stuff in there that I'm not even going to go into because my heart can't handle it right now. But um, so I want y'all to know that that's in the room but over here. And um, so make yourself available of all that. But if you can't do that, you can't afford that, guess what? You can stream it on Spotify. So I know most people wouldn't tell you that because <laughs> it takes money out your pocket, but who cares? I just want you to get ministered to. So the music is a ministry. This song is called I It Won't Rain Forever. And I know if you're anything like me, it's been raining and storming in your life. You know, I've got some things going on in my life. I've got uh, raising a seven and eight year old grandsons who are very, 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 very much boys, and which means that holes and marker and many other things happen in my house. <laughs> <laughs> my my newly renovated house that's still being renovated, and then we have to go back and fix everything they did while we're still painting. So anyway, it's raining in my house. And so I know that a lot of you are dealing with your own issues and your own problems. And it, the wonderful thing about it is storms don't last all the, all the time. You know, Katrina came, it blew through New Orleans and, and messed up a whole lot of stuff, but guess what? It past. It came and it went. And then another one came. It wasn't as big as Katrina, but it was another storm. And it came and it went. And so we know that each storm that comes in our lives makes us stronger and helps us to prepare for the next one, right? It won't rain forever. don't know where you are so how can you know where you're going you're struggling in the dark you feel lost and hopeless But just hold on, it won't last. Remember, child, it's only come to pass. It won't rain forever. It won't rain forever. No, it won't rain forever. The sun's gonna shine again. See, God knows right where you are. He knows where you're going. See, he's watching over you. Oh, he hears every prayer unspoken. See, he's your shelter, your strong tower. Oh, he's with you in your darkest hour. It won't rain forever. No, it won't rain forever. No, it won't rain forever. No, 
forever The sun's gonna shine again Oh, that's just because He's faithful Oh, He's faithful Yet He is able He's able You know He's faithful Yes, He is and he is able oh, he'll do exactly what he said he'll do he's faithful oh yes he's faithful and he is able See, the sun's going to shine again. It won't rain forever. The sun's going to shine again. Yes, it is. The sun's going to shine again. Amen. Well, y'all like all my luggage? I got a lot of luggage. There's a whole lot of stuff in here. And I mean, it's heavy. Oh, my goodness. You know, our lives are filled with our baggage, all kinds of baggage. All kind of junk. Some of it, you know, we need to get rid of. <coughs> some of it's good stuff, you know. I might, I might should take out some of this, <laughs> some of this stuff. I probably don't need like the chocolate that's in there. <laughs> probably could you keep the fruit that's in there and get rid of all the sweets. But our lives can be like that pile of luggage there, just stuffed full and completely i don't know if y'all do y'all pack like me i'm i'm gonna pack as much as i can all the way literally up to the pound that they said i can carry i have my scale and i pack all that stuff in my suitcase and i stick it on that scale and i'm like oh i got two more pounds let me, let me stick this in there oh i got a few more ounces i can fit this in there because i'm gonna get my money's worth i'm, I'm gonna stuff it but in our lives when, you know, we have all of our luggage, we have a habit of, of hiding behind all of it. And the title of my message today is Stop Hiding Behind the Baggage. I don't know if you're taking notes, but I recommend it. Take some notes. Might want to keep track of some of these things. You know, I found that um, when I go to church, I need to have something. Thank God for iPhones nowadays because you can just open up your notes nowadays and just type it in real fast. But I like to have something to, to write down because I'm expecting, I'm expecting God to speak to me. If you're not expecting God to speak to you, then, you know, okay, don't come with nothing. <laughs> and you probably get nothing. But when you come to church, come to church expecting to hear from God, you know? And I know we don't just go to God to get, but, I mean, he did provide a whole lot of stuff for us. So if we want it, we've got to come expecting to receive from him. And so I'm praying that today you will receive a word from the Lord. Let's open up in prayer. Father God, I pray that, that you would just minister to your people today, that you would give me your mind and your words, Lord God, that would encourage those that are listening. And Father, I thank you that those that are listening and, and, and taking those notes, Lord, that you are going to impart into them something that will be lasting, that they can carry on out this door and apply to their lives. In Jesus' name, amen. In the Bible, we have many characters that... Um, 
that hid from God. And my whole message is kind of based on Saul, but I'm going to hit some of the others. And I want to start with Saul. Saul was an interesting character to me. The other day I was, um, I'm actually reading the life of David, studying the life of David. And it talked about Saul and some of the things that he was dealing with. And it just hit me differently. It just did. It's, it's funny how you can read the same thing over and over again and, and not catch it, you know? And so I was reading about how Saul was, um, his father sent him to look for the donkeys. And he's out looking for donkeys. And as he's looking, he's not finding them, right? And so the, his servant said, you know, let's go to the prophet. Let's go to the prophet. Maybe the prophet can tell us where we can find our donkeys. So they go and they look for the prophet. Well, God had already told the prophet that this man was going to be coming his way, that this was going to be the new king of Israel. So Saul gets to the prophet, and the prophet tells him, you know, you're going to go to the sacrifice with me. And I know Saul's like, what in the world? I'm just looking for my donkeys. <laughs> I just want my donkeys. What in the world is going on? And so they go up, they have the, the meal, and, and the prophet tells him, okay, meet me tomorrow at this time. And, and so I guess he's like, man, this, this is a big ordeal to find some donkeys, right? And so he finally, he meets up with them. And the prophet tells him he is going to be the next king, the king, the first king, the first king of Israel. Now, this is just a man who the day before was just working in the fields, doing what his dad told him to do, and all of a sudden, this prophet is telling him he's going to be the first king of Israel. And so, you know, all these things happen. He's anointed. The Spirit of God comes on him. He prophesies. He goes. He follows the instructions of the prophet, and then he goes home. And then there comes time for him to be revealed to the, the, to the Israelites. And <laughs> and so they're asking, so who is going to be the king? And they start to draw the straws. And the one who was drawn was Saul because God had preordained for him to be king. And so they're looking around. They're like, where is Saul? Where is Saul? Hey, Saul, where are you? Okay, Saul had just been told just a few weeks prior, that he was going to be king. So he already knew this. And where was he? He's down here. Hiding. Hiding. It's like, why was Saul hiding? Why was he hiding behind the baggage? God had to tell them he's over there hiding. You know what really stood out to me? God knew where he was. God knows where you are. And he knows where you're hiding and what you're hiding from. Saul was hiding from the call that God had, had put on his life. And he had reason. <laughs> I mean, would you want to be the first king of Israel? After Israel complained about God not providing for them, and not wanting the, the judges that God had provided for them. They wanted more. They, wanted, they thought they knew better than God. And so God said, guess what? I'm going to give you exactly what you asked for. I would not want to be the one that, after getting reprimanded, saying, oh, and you're the one that's going to lead all these people. And so Saul was, was afraid to stand up and take on what God had called for him to do. And that's, that's a scary, scary thought. Saul thought he was inadequate. How do we know that he thought he was inadequate? Because he said, who am I? I am from the smallest tribe. Who is my father that you would choose me to do this? And God has called all of us to certain things, and we feel like, well, we're, we're too inadequate to do this. How can I do this? I'm getting, I'm getting too old to do this kind of stuff. I can't raise two little boys, seven and eight. 
I did my dues. <laughs> you know, I did my thing. You know, how am I going to go into the workforce? I haven't worked in all these years. I've been raising kids. How am I going to go out into a workforce? How am I going to start a ministry? I don't have a dime to my name. I don't, I've never been to Bible college. I've never done any of this stuff. How am I going to start a business? I don't know anything about businesses. But God doesn't care about all of that. He just wants to know, are you available? Are you willing? He knows we're broken. He knows we're shattered. He knows all about that. You know, I remember my godmama used to tell me, Barbara Joe, you're going to sing to millions all over the world one day. God's going to use you as a Joseph, and, and you're going to, you know, do all this stuff. And I used to look at her like she was crazy. And I, I mean, I loved my godmama. My godmama led almost every member of our family to Christ. She was a powerful woman of God. <coughs> And she used to tell me these things. And as I grew up and I went through some different abuses, was assaulted as a teenager. Matter of fact, the guy that assaulted me was a small-time pimp and said I was going to work for him. And God brought me out of that before I could get entrenched in that. God rescued me from that situation. And then with me and my hard head, I walked into an abusive marriage for 15 years. And I'm thinking, how could God possibly use me? I've wasted so many years. My good years, I wasted. I wasted on a man. I wasted on my self-pity and all the other junk, all the other baggage that I had. I wasted. But see, with God, he, he don't care about all that. He's like, I don't care that you wasted. I can redeem that time. I can redeem those years. What are you talking about? I'm God. I can give you back the things that you lost. So we need to stop hiding behind our, our baggage of, I can't do that. I, I, I'm, I'm, I, I can't, I'm not able to do that. I'm not, I'm not good enough. I'm not smart enough. We got to get out from behind that baggage. Let's look at uh, Adam and Eve in Genesis. Matter of fact, it's chapter 3, verse 9. Where Adam, <laughs> where God says, Adam, Eve. Actually, he said, Adam, because he was the one responsible. Where are you? <coughs> God knew where he was. He wanted him to admit that he was hiding. Why was he hiding? He was hiding because he was in sin. And that sin brought shame. So he was hiding from God. But God knew where he was. God made that garden. He knew exactly where it was. Adam, why? Why are you hiding? He's called some of y'all. He said, why are you hiding? You know, I see your sin. I know what you're doing. I know what you're hiding. I know that you're up late at night on the computer looking at stuff you ain't supposed to be looking at. I know you got a side boo over here that nobody knows about. I know that you're in an emotional relationship with somebody you ain't supposed to be in an emotional relationship with. He said, I know that you're struggling with this identity lie that the enemy has put out. I know what you're dealing with. See, we can put on our filters, our front. Oh, I got it all together. I'm going to tell you my truth. I put a post out earlier this week and said, you know what? Your truth is irrelevant. Because if it's not God's truth, it's not true. So this whole new, you know, we're going to come up with these catchy phrases, you know. Girl, you tell your truth. You live your truth. Your truth is a lie. Your truth is a lie if it is not based on the word of God. And if you're wondering why your life is following ap falling apart, it's because you're living your truth, which is a false truth that the enemy has given you and you've fallen for. When are we going to get tired of falling for the same, same things over and over again that the enemy keeps bringing up? An abused woman 
will marry the same man in different clothes and different hair. It's the same guy. You'll date the same one over and over and over and over again until you get free. You'll make the same mistakes over and over again until you get free. So God wants us, one, come out from behind your baggages of sin. Admit to God. Yeah, I, you know, God's saying, hey, where, you, wh- where are you? He knows where you are, but he wants you to admit, I'm here, over here in sin. I'm over here in my sin, God. He wants us to lay that down because that is hindering us from getting all the blessings that God has for us. We, stop, we, we blame it on God. God, you said you were going to take care of me. God, you said you were going to do this for me. You were going to do that for me. But you're living like the devil over here. And you're expecting God to bless your mess. God says, no, you, no, I'm not going to do that. If you want the blessings of God, you have to follow in his word and in his way. Come out from the baggage of sin. My next character I want to bring up is Elijah. Elijah was a man of God. He is a prophet who had literally just seen one of the biggest miracles in his ministry. And I mean, I mean, he's up there making fun of the, <laughs> the prophets of Baal. I mean, he's like, ha! Come on, guys. Let's see your God bring down fire. Oh, where, where's he at? Where, where, where's your God at? He, oh, he's over there on the ba- in the bathroom. He's on the toilet over there. Uh, you know, he's, he's like making fun of him. And then when it came time for him to do his thing, he gets up there, and, and he, all he had to do is speak the word of God because he was a man of God. He knew what, what the word said. You know, but he had lived and, and what he had heard from God. And he called down fire. Fire came down. And I mean, it was a, a wonderful, like, man, huge miracle. Then he told him, he said, you know what? The rain's coming. There was no, not a cloud in the sky. He said, the rain's coming. And the drought's going to come to an end. He sends this guy out to look. There's no clouds. Sends the guy back, look again. Well, there's a, there's a cloud about the size of a man's hand. And he says, okay, the rain's coming. And sure enough, the rain came. He ended up in in a miracle, outrunning the king back to Jezreel, which is, I forget how many, I think they said it was like 100 miles, something like that. He ran. It was the Spirit of God was upon him, and he ran. So this is another miracle. And then fear hit him. It's amazing how we can see God, we can experience God, God can do marvelous and wonderful works in our life and our ministry, and all of a sudden it takes one thing of the devil to r- have us running in fear. And he was afraid of Jezebel. He had literally just saw God bring fire out of the sky. And he's afraid of this woman. He had just experienced the power of God causing him to run for miles and outrun a chariot. I'm like, come on. And now he's afraid of this woman. And he leaves and he goes and hides. We've all done it. We've got up and we've, we've you know, spit and hollered and jumped and shouted and you know God did it God did it God did it and then the devil you know comes and this bill you open it up and it's like your house is going up for foreclosure and we go running and hiding in fear but our great God said why why are you hiding behind your bag of fear come out from that baggage and let me handle this I've got this too. You know, there's nothing too great for God to do. I mean, he really is a big God. I mean, if you just go out and you see all those trees changing colors and every year at the same time, those same trees turn colors and the leaves fall off. 
And at the same time, every year, little buds come on those branches and new leaves come forth. Every single year. How does it do that? How does it do that? God. If God is concerned about the foliage, you know, and he's going to make that tree do what it needs to do to prepare for the next season, don't you think he's going to do even more for you? So whatever the devil is telling you, saying, well, you need to be afraid because you're about to lose your job. What are you going to do now? You got all these kids. You got all these bills. How are you going to handle that? God told me to step away from, uh, I, I sing for Jimmy Swagger Ministries, but I had sung for him for 24 years. And I mean, I was, I was comfortable. Oh, my gosh, I was so comfortable. I had just bought a brand new red Camaro, and I had a brand new house. I was paying for the kids to be in private school. I mean, it was, I was living the dream. And God told me to quit my job. I was like, again, that ain't God. <laughs> it's funny how I immediately like, no, that ain't God, you know. And God said, it's time for you to go out. God don't want me to do that. doesn't make any sense. I've got teenagers about to go into, to college. i got college to pay for. I've got a brand new car. with. Mo- i got a mortgage. Like, I, what in the world? I mean, I'm on television. I'm ministering to people all over the world. That doesn't make any sense. Why would I leave something that people are, like, knocking the door down to try to get? That doesn't make any sense. But God often does not make sense. He wanted me to get out from my baggage and listen and follow his word. So I did what he told me to do. And for nine ye- almost nine years, he had me in school. It was my seminary. He had me in my seminary. I learned a whole lot. I learned how to trust him. I learned how to have faith and believe. And, uh, you know, I realized that yesterday I was thinking about all of this. And and I realized, you know, this whole thing of me believing God for for the retreats, he taught me how to believe him for my house when my house went up for foreclosure. And he provided. He showed me how to believe him for the bills to get paid when the bills were insurmountable and I didn't have the money coming in. He showed me how to believe for him to pay for an album that I didn't have money to pay for. And then this last album was the most expensive album I ever put forth in my life. And I was like, this doesn't make any sense to do this album. Is I can make an album and it can sound good and I can do it for a quarter of the price. God wanted me to learn to believe and to trust and to have faith in him that he can do it and that's what he's doing in your life get out from behind your baggage of fear you know when when we have these things in our life there's there's something that we're lacking and i want you to write this down first of all adam and eve their problem was sin they were hiding behind the baggage of sin what were they lacking they were lacking god They did not have God in their lives. We need to have God in our life. That's what removes the sin from our life is a relationship with God. They needed a relationship with God. Elisha was dealing with fear, which means he had a lack of courage. Over and over and over in the word, just, just look up scriptures on courage. And you'll find the word saying, fear not, have courage. Be courageous. Over and over again, God wants us to be courageous because this world that we're going into, that we're facing, is a hard world. And we have to have that courage to be able to face some of the things that we are going to face. It's not an if. It's we are going to face some hard things, and we have to believe God. We have to be able to come out from behind our baggage. And the next one is failure. Failure. The lack of confidence. Who was our failure that hit? It's one of them. P. 
Peter, Peter walked with God. Peter saw the, the miracles. Peter had some preconceived ideas of how it was going to go. And so sometimes God will call us to ministry. And we get in our head, oh, well, this is how it's going to be. This is how we're, we can do it this way, and it can go this way. And, and Peter kind of had in his head that Jesus was going to do all these miraculous things, and they were all going to be this, these famous people, and they were going to all do all this stuff. And then Jesus dies on a cross. And he's like, wait a minute. This is the most shameful way to die in that time. To die on a cross was the most shameful way to die. They didn't see their Savior that was going to rescue them from the Romans dying on a Roman cross. I mean, that's, that, that wasn't in the vision. <laughs> but on top of that, Peter, who had walked with God, denied him. He stood there in view of Jesus, one he loved, one he believed in and trusted. And he said, I, I, I don't know him. I don't know him. And he ran. But then as when Jesus rose, Jesus met with them and he saw him. But I believe in Jesus, I mean, in Peter's heart, he felt like he had failed God so badly by denying him, by not recognizing that God's plan was going to be different than his plan. And he decided, I'm just going to go back and fish again. I'm just going to go back to what I was doing, you know. How many times do we do that in our lives? You know, we get, we get excited, you know. God's got a plan. We're going to do this and we're going to do this and blah, blah, blah. And, and then it doesn't turn out like you think it's going to turn out because we kind of got our preconceived ideas in the way. But God's still in it. I mean, God was all in that cross. He was all in everything. And he still was like, man, you know, we can just get so confused. Like, I don't know what's going on. And God says, get out from behind your baggage of failure. A lot of times we go back to what we had known. Peter was so backslidden at this point in his life that when Jesus called out to him, he didn't even recognize that it was him. It was John who said, that is the Lord. He should have known because it was the same exact instance that brought him to Jesus in the first place. When Jesus told him to cast the net and he'd catch fish, and he did, he used the same exact scenario to call Peter back to him. If you're backslidden today, and you fail God, and you feel like I can't do anything, come out from behind the baggage. Disobedience. Jonah, he took off running. He ended up hiding in a boat because he hated the people he had to preach to. God may be sending you to people that you don't like. Your family, another color, another nation. Who knows? And you're hiding because you don't want to do it, because you don't like them people. But you don't know that God's going to give you a love that's going to keep you up nights praying for them when you get out from behind your baggage. We want to know that if we're in failure, we're lacking confidence. It's for your notes. If you're in disobedience, it's a lack of love. God wants to impart love into your heart. Inadequate, Saul was inadequate. He thought he was inadequate. He didn't have the ability to do what God's called him to do. He had a lack of trust. God has a plan for each one of you. And it's bigger than you just feeling better about yourself. You know, we go, we, we want to run from one conference to the next conference to the next thing and just feel good. We want to feel good, you know. So we're going to go wherever that feel good is going to give us. And God said it's more about, than about you feeling good. It's about a purpose. He wants you to know that he can handle you. He can handle your limitations. He can take care of all of that. 
He can bring in the funds when you need the funds. He can take care of the, the sin. He can cleanse that. He can change your attitude if you don't love. He can restore all of these things to you if you're available. If you're a willing heart. If you're one who has faith and will trust him. That's what he wants from you. He wants you to get out from behind here. And you know why? Because when you get healed, when you get restored, when you get refreshed, when you get all the things that God's got for you, when you get that vision of, you know what, God's will is not going to be like mine, but I'm willing to do it, I'm willing to follow him wherever he takes me, then you will start to see things change in your life. And you'll know that God has a plan for you. And that plan is to see the body of Christ become whole. The reason why our nation, our churches, our families are falling apart is because there are broken, shattered women everywhere. God has a purpose for women. He made us strong. He made us able to bear children. And I know that there's some men out there saying they can bear a child. I'd like to see it happen. They'd be crying. <laughs> Serious. They could not handle it. They could not handle the nine months of mood changes and, and sickness and all the other things, let alone the birth itself. God made us strong for a reason not so that we can just I'm gonna be who I am and I'm gonna do my thing no because he wants you to bring forth the coming of Christ we have a purpose and that is to minister to our children our husbands and to our communities and then beyond and when we are in our rightful place when we are whole when we are complete then God can use us in the place that he has assigned for us. And if we're not in our assignment, the coming of Christ is delayed. We have to do our part as part of the kingdom. Remember, it's not about you feeling good. It's not so you can have a nice house and sit back and say, you know, I got, I got my blessings, y'all go on. No, it's so you can go tell somebody, come see a man who told me all about myself and yet he loves me, and he gave me hope. Let's stand up. Lord Jesus, we thank you this morning.